Good evening. Good to see everyone. Brother Randy, give me just a tad bit more volume, if you would. Let's all stand. Good to see everyone. Let's sing a hymn together this evening. We got some that are still coming in, and we got young people all over the place. It's good to see everyone here. This is a great, great crowd. And, uh, let's sing, Are You Weary? Are You Heavy Hearted? Tell it to Jesus. Are you weary? Are you heavy hearted? Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. Are you grieving over joys departed? Tell it to Jesus alone. Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. He is a friend. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to, uh, Lord, just come to you and approach your throne boldly through your precious Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, we thank you that we can come together on this Wednesday evening. And uh, Lord, I pray that you will help us. And uh, Lord, we pray that you will uh, encourage us in the Lord. And uh, Lord, if you will just see fit, uh, Lord, to uh, encourage us uh, greatly tonight. We, this world needs Jesus, and we all need to focus on Him. And Lord, I pray you'll just uh, help us. Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Uh, good to see everyone here this evening. Uh, we've got, uh, of course, our Bible study and prayer, and so we're going to take some time and um, focus on that for just a little bit. There's some needs that we have. I have some friends that live in the state of Michigan. And if you guys would just shut those back doors, if you would, there's no need for those. After after some families come in, just shut those, if you would. There, um, uh, there's a family that uh, lives in Michigan. the uh, The last name is Hodge, and uh, James and Ashley Hodge, and uh, they have a little boy, and he is, uh, I think he's probably what two or three years old. And uh, do you know his name, honey? Anyway, um, is. Hudson, okay, Hudson, and um, I just found out just before service, um, but uh, they, they got this little boy, he's a precious little boy, well, anyway, his stomach uh, started swelling the last week or so, uh, bloated, I guess, and they had thought originally that it was nothing very serious, and of course, it never, they, they tried some things, of course, uh, there at home, and, uh, but then the, the more uh, severe it got, they, the, the way they worded it, was that um, it, it was uh, not pain? The, the, it didn't seem like it bothered the boy, but uh, certainly the mother uh, seen what was going on, and so um, she uh, took him to the hospital. They immediately or took him to the doctor, and immediately they called an ambulance, and uh, they seen some things and saw that it was very serious. And so he is currently uh, in the hospital there in Michigan and awaiting surgery. And I'm not sure. Uh, do you know when the surgery is? They announced it just a little bit ago. Anyway, he has a, a, a tumor that is very big around his kidneys, and then he's got uh, tumors on his lungs, and they're not sure uh, what it is. They, they, the doctors uh, 
uh, will know more. They're going to do the surgery very soon to take out the tumor, and they'll know more about uh, the small tumors, if it's cancerous or benign. Pray for, um, pray for Hudson, if you would. Hud- Hudson, and his last name is Hodge. If you would, pray for those, and uh, it would be a big blessing to uh, them. And then also the, uh, pray for the, uh, the Jenkins family. That is the grandparents. Of course, Pastor Jenkins is a uh, pastor in North Carolina. And if you would pray for them, and it would be a huge blessing there to, to that family there. I see some folks here tonight that um, that uh, been answered prayer. I see uh, Jim Riley. Jim, it's good to see you. I uh, had surgery uh, last week, I believe it was. And so uh, good to see Jim in our, in our uh, congregation this evening and uh, see his wife. And then uh, we've got Austin Kingsley. Continue to pray for him. David Beach, if you would, pray for uh, David. And others that are uh, just facing some things and doing and just going through uh, trials and tribulations, if you would pray for pray for those. How many of you's got an unspoken request tonight? Unspoken request. We've got some needs tonight. I know I do, and uh, we've got some things in, in in some of our church families that need prayer. And uh, so I'm looking forward to the Bible study tonight. If you're visiting with us for the very first time, you've never been to Bible Baptist before. There's a little card in uh, some of the seats in front of you. If you would take time to take that out, we've got some visiting uh, families. Of course, don't forget, uh, we, we've got uh, kind of a summer kids club. Uh, what we're calling is kind of a in-between between Awana, since Awana's was cut short, and uh, we had to cancel that during the uh, pandemic. Uh, then you can um, uh, put your kids over there uh, between ages basically three and nine or ten years old, eleven years old, and then we have the teens, and teens are meeting tonight, and uh, so that's good. I've been on the uh, road preaching the last couple weeks and just uh, en- enjoying what God's doing. Uh, sometimes my summer gets a little uh, crazy, and so I'm, I'm looking forward to the next few weeks being uh, at our church on Wednesday nights. I miss it. There's no church like Bible Baptist, and this is a great crowd. I'm looking out and seeing lots of folks, and this is great for what we're in. And uh, the Lord has been mighty good to us, and very thankful for that. And uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we will. Jacob, if you would sing one for us, would you do that for us? And then I'll come back, and uh, I'll teach you out of the book of James. We'll continue in that study uh, this evening, and uh, then we'll... Um, We'll, we'll get out and uh, we'll pray for all of these as well. So uh, let's go, Lord, in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to, uh, again, come uh, tonight. Thank you for visitors that are here and returning guests. And, uh, Lord, I pray tonight as a church that we can come together in unity and in prayer. And, uh, Lord, in thanksgiving. And we can pray, Lord, especially for Hudson tonight that is very urgent. He's in the... Um, Lord, the hospital there, and Lord, we're awaiting to see uh, God's will be done there in his life and his family. I can't imagine what mom and dad's going through tonight, and uh, Lord, what grandparents are going through tonight. And Lord, I pray that the doctors, when they get inside uh, there, and and they, uh, Lord, they discover that them tumors, that God, it'll be exactly what they prepared for, and uh, God, that this little boy can be healed up soon and go back home. Lord, I just pray that you would have your will and way in all of our church members. Uh, we've got some that are really battling through some health crises right now. And uh, God, we need your touch. America needs God. I pray you'll help us. Help our church to be a light. Uh, God, to, to reach our community like we did this past weekend and see souls saved and uh, see lives changed. God, we ask all these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. Jacob, you, you sing for us. I've not always been faithful, but He has. I've not always been graceful, but He has. I've not always been true, but He always came through. He has. Great. 
strong and he says I am when I feel I can't go on he says I can when I'm tempted to sin and I fail the test again he passed yes he has he has been the greatest friend I've ever known he has laid the dead on Calvary all ahead but I know he has I can't conquer death but he has I've not loved everyone not always overcome but he has yes he has he Jacob. Isn't that wonderful? That's good, isn't it? And uh, turn your Bibles, if you would, to James chapter 2. If you would, pray for my wife's stepdad. And uh, we received news before the service that um, it wasn't very good news, uh, to say the least. And so do pray for uh, Rebecca's mother. And um, we'll, we'll give you more detail maybe later. But uh, just pray for them, and uh, if you would, and, and that uh, God's will be done there. And then my grandmother, uh, 89 years old, fell Saturday and broke her shoulder. And uh, she's already battling um, some dementia. And uh, I'm going to leave first thing in the morning and drive up and drive back to West Virginia and see her. I've not seen my grandmother in a, a little while because of the virus. And uh, my grandpa is on oxygen. He was a coal miner for 40-some uh, years, and he's got black lung, and he's... Um, just you know, smoker and uh, his lungs are shot, and so any uh, any um, uh, any of that stuff getting near him would have been detrimental, and still would be, I'm sure. And so we're being very careful tomorrow. But I've got to see my grandmother. So pray for her. her name's Betty Cox, and uh, she is a sweet, sweet lady, and she's the one that started uh, Jesus in our family. Uh, before her, uh, nothing but outlaws and convicts. No, seriously. Uh, she went to church December 5th, December, uh, actually it would have been uh, November, maybe maybe December 1st or November 30th, I'm not sure, uh, of 1969, and she got saved, and the next week my dad got saved, 15-year-old boy, um, a great story, anyway, uh, that started literally Jesus in our family, before that there was no God uh, in none of the family, and uh, she broke that generational curse and uh, she went in and um, she heard Oliver B. Green she said you know up there Oliver B. Green come on all the country western uh, she'd hear him on the radio and she'd get so mad at him she'd he'd come on with that raspy voice and uh, he had the most unique voice ever and still comes on the radio but uh, he would come on the country music uh, around lunchtime and she'd be cooking and she said I don't want to hear that thing and turn it off 
And she said the reason she didn't want to hear Oliver Green is what he said. He, he'd always, uh, one time she, she was about to touch, he said, now don't touch that dial. And, and uh, you know, he just said some unique things. But, but uh, God already had her number before, uh, before you know, uh, he had already, there was some conviction and things that had already started place. But she, they got saved, First Baptist Church in Beaver, West Virginia. Pastor Gene Garlow, great man of God. And uh, he's in heaven now. So uh, just a, a wonderful thing. If you would pray for her, if you would, that would be a huge blessing to us. And uh, James chapter 2, we're going to continue. We, we're going verse by verse through the book of James as we have been. I love this. We love uh, expositional teaching and uh, love the word of God. It's nothing like it. James chapter 2, if there's anything more relevant for today's society, James chapter 2, at least the first 10, 11 verses, uh, you're not going to find anything more relevant speaking about uh, partiality uh, and about uh, uh, preference, preferential treatment, about uh, 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 racism. Um, you name it, it's, it's right here. And uh, the world needs to hear about Jesus. We don't need to virtue signal. We don't need to get up and make some big thing on a stage and and uh, get everybody up here singing kumbaya, holding hands and grabbing a post and saying, the, I seen a video one of these churches did this past week. Of course, this church is doctrinal uh, in error, uh, like a lot of churches are. But uh, they grabbed, they had all these different uh, nationalities up there, and they had this big old stick in the middle of the stage. And they said, now all of you grab the, the stick. Now these were all pastors and leaders, I guess. And uh, they said, now grab the stick and do this. And they raised the stick and hit it on the ground. And they said, we're done. We're done. Now, this is in front of the church. Racism is done. And I thought, what in the world? And, uh, I mean, just craziness that's going on in society. Uh, and, and they just need to read their Bible. They need to get doctrinally sound and get in the Bible and read what God... And by the way, we, uh, sin creates, uh, a sin problem creates a skin problem, right? And uh, all of it is just dealt with through God's Word and we have a sin problem in, in America and in our world. Uh, look at verse 1, James, or, uh, James chapter 2, and look with me in verse number 1. The Bible says, My brethren... Have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. For if there come unto you as a, uh, your assembly a man. Now understand, James is, is, is teaching, and, and this book is written to the twelve tribes uh, of, Christian, of Christians. They were written to Christians of the twelve tribes, Jewish Christians. So this is not to the lost. If there come to you a man with, uh, in your assembly, a man with a gold ring, so he's, he's a wealthy man, in goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, or, or not so pleasant apparel, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, or the, or the nice clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. So you would give preferential treatment to someone that... And listen, this stuff happens today. This stuff happens today where, where someone will come in and they have nice... Maybe they, the, the pastor or the, the leader see a man or a lady drive in in a very nice car. Oh man, make sure they have a good time at church today. Make sure you set them in a nice place. And don't set them around that family. You know what I mean? Now here at our church, we have several services on Sunday morning, but you don't get to, uh, listen, we, we, it ain't like we have this big massive auditorium where you get your little choice. I'm going to sit over here, or this is going to be my spot. It's first come, first serve here. I mean, you might end up in the PA booth, who knows? And uh, hey, if we run out of room, you might end up over here in this little section, who knows? But there's really no, we're not going to, there's no preferential treatment. There's nobody, well, that's my seed, and, and, and uh, I'm a big giver, so I get to sit over here, or I'm the, eh, nobody, nobody does that. But you realize that that stuff does happen, that there are some that the rich and poor, the poor people is cast out. I have an evangelist friend, Jimmy Clark, uh, grew up very poor, very poor, and uh, he was about a 10-year-old boy, 11-year-old boy when this took place, but he, he, the First Baptist Church of Lexington, North Carolina was literally right across the street. And he said he wanted to go to church. 
Now, his mom and dad at that time, I don't think, went to church. And he said, so as a 10 or 11-year-old boy, I just wanted to walk across the street and go to this church. And he said, I walked in. He said, my, I didn't have good shoes on. He said, I literally had holes in my jeans. And he said, my mama kept me clean, but I was, my, my, my clothes were tattered, literally, secondhand, thirdhand, uh, down. He said, it uh, didn't look very good. And he said, they literally caught me at the door and said, now, son, there's a place for you upstairs in the balcony. He said, so I went up there, and I noticed there wasn't many people up there at all. And he said, you sat over there. And he said, I sat by myself. The second week, the same thing. The third week, the same thing. Until I figured out that all the rest of the boys and girls got to sit on the main floor. But I got to sit up there away from everybody because I was a, I was a, a poor kid. Now, if they would have realized who they were setting up in the balcony, if they realized that one day he would grow up and be an evangelist and he would travel all over the nation and be a, a, a great man and his kids would be lawyers and, and, and in the medical field, if they would have realized that, that that family would have, oh, they would have said, sir, won't you come on down here? You're, but, but no, uh, preferential treatment, it happens. This was a dilemma. Now, notice what else? Verse 4. Are ye not then partial in yourselves and are become judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Do not they blaspheme that... that uh, uh, worthy name, do they, uh, verse 7, do they not blaspheme that worthy name by which ye are called? If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin, and have convinced of the law as transgressors. For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, do not commit adultery, and said, uh, said also, do not kill. Now if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, we, uh, Lord, come to you uh, with the word of God. Lord, as James said earlier in the text, may we not just be hearers of the word, may we be doers. May we never look at society through the lens of the world. May we never look at people and judge them for their current status with the world. May we look at them through the lens of love and through biblical love, through the Bible, through love for sinners. We ask all these things in the name of Christ. Amen. Go back with me in verse 1. We see a dilemma in partiality. Uh, the, the Bible says in James 2 verse 1, now listen to this. I don't know how far I'll get, but I want you to listen. He says, my brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. Now, we wouldn't think that there sh would be prejudice in the church, but, but there is. They're, they're, they're always because they're sin. We understand that the church is made up of just, we're sinners, right? And that's who we are. We're broken people. We're, we're, we're messed up. And, and we, we've been broken by sin. Matter of fact, Galatians chapter 3 verse 28 says, There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. So according to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, there's only one race. Amen. And that's children of God. And uh, we all, if you, and I say this all the time, but if you were to uh, cut my flesh and uh, cut my brother in Christ, brother Akinya, uh, we bleed the same color blood, right? Because that's who we are. We're, 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 we're brothers in Christ, and, and though our skin color may be different, uh, folks, that's my brother back there. See, and, and that's how we are. That's how we should be. We're one race with Christ. And, and uh, that's when we get to heaven. That's, we're we're going to be children, sons and daughters in the Lord Jesus Christ. But, but on earth, sin has created a racial divide. 
And I know you, some of you may be t- even tired of talking about it and, and tired of listening to it on the news. It's been worn out. It's been so, it's been so talked about and so misconstrued. And, and, and yes, racism does exist. And yes, partiality does exist. But folks, this is where we're at in society. And you might as well just get used to it because we're going to live here because it's sin. Well, I just don't want to, it just doesn't exist. I don't want to talk about it anymore. Well, you can go ahead and you can, you can exit out of your mind and you can say, well, I'm just not going. But folks, it is every day. Pastors and leaders all over this country is dealing with this every day. It's something that we uh, are dealing with on the forefront. And folks, I've said it from the very beginning, but the Bible Baptist Church here in Simpsonville is a church for all people. And you can see it on Sundays and even on Wednesdays. You can see that we love people. If Jesus loves them, we love them. And they're different all all over the board. But hey, it's a soul in whom Jesus died for. Sin has created major problems. In Christ, the one place that everyone truly is equal. And that, and that equality ought to be reflected in the church. And I've heard it time and time again when people visit our church. They say, oh, we just love the fact that everyone here is not the same. They don't look the same. They're not the same. That, well, that's the way it should be, right? So there's the problem declared, though. Notice James compares the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. Look back with me in verse 1. And then he says, with the respect of person. So he compares I believe the point that James is making here just right off the bat in chapter 2 is he's making a true faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and prejudice cannot go together. So for you to say, now listen to me, for you to say, uh, well, I, I'm saved, but I'm, I, 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 I can li- uh, be a little racist. That's the most contradictory uh, contradictory, uh, statement you could possibly make. There's no way that you can be saved, a child of God, and be hateful or hate-filled toward another race. Not according to what the Bible says. Deuteronomy chapter 10. I'll have you turn a few places here in a minute. But Deuteronomy chapter 10. The Bible says, For the Lord your God is the God of gods, And Lord of lords, and a great God, a mighty and terrible, which regardeth, listen to this, which regardeth not persons, nor taketh reward. You know what he's saying in Deuteronomy? He doesn't look at one particular race as superior. God doesn't. Do you realize God was neither white nor black? He was Jewish. Jesus. Jesus Christ. Jewish man. Well, we've tried to make him everything. But you know what? (laughs) He was a Jewish man. I've been to Israel. They're not white. They're not black. They got a beautiful skin tone. But they're, and by the way, they're probably the most hated people on the earth right now. The Bible says in Romans 10 11, for there is no respect of persons with God. The Bible says in Acts 10, 34, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 9, And ye masters do the same things unto them, forbearing, threatening, knowing that your master also in heaven, neither is there respect of persons with him. How many more verses do we need that shows that God does not show any favoritism toward any race or any sect of people? Jesus Christ died for and loves everyone the same. So we can go back to the childhood song that we have sung for many years. Jesus loves the little children. All the children of the world, yellow, red, black, and white, they're all precious in His sight. Isn't that, isn't that our Lord? We can't play favorites in the church either. So then we see, again, going back to verse 1, the person described. Notice what James says in verse 1. He describes Jesus as the Lord of glory. Now that reminds me of the Shekinah glory of God. That radiance. And here's what I believe about this. I believe when we focus on the glory of God, we don't see the success and failures and the prosperity and poverty of others. 
If it truly is about the glory of God, when you come to church, you want to see Jesus high and lifted up, and you'll worship Him in spirit and in truth, and you will, then you won't mind sitting beside someone that doesn't smell the best. Right? You don't mind being around people. Well, I just would rather sit over here because you know, these are where my friends sit. But hold on a second. When Jesus is truly in His glory, and it truly is become not a social club, but a church, that we worship Him in spirit and in truth, and you don't care where you sit. Hey, and sometimes, let me just say this, sometimes it's good for us to move around a little bit. Get to know some people. Well, they're sitting in my seat. Well, they should sit in your seat. Because last time I checked, nobody's seat has a name on it. You know, they're, they're, we don't, you know they're, just, they're just seats. I've been asked to come to Africa next year and, and, and help our, our brother, um, uh, brother Eric Chapman. He's been coming to our church the last few months and his wife, and they are precious. They're missionaries in three different locations in the world. One in Moldova. They've got two youth camps there. Uh, a, a great, great work. Started 200 churches. Got, uh, turned them over to na nationals. And, and now they're in Malawi, Africa. They leave. They were supposed to leave today. I think they did. They're not sure how far they'll get. Because the country has been closed, but they were burned. I'm talking about in their 60s, and their desire is to go and, and continue to be with their people. He said, Preacher, I know it's uh, a short notice, but I would love for you to go to, to Malawi, Africa next year and preach to our pastors and train them. They come out of the bush. He said, I know it, it sounds crazy, but we literally get off the plane and get in a Land Rover. And we drive for several hours through the bush and we go to this hut of a church and these, these pastors come from all over and they're hungry and you preach from morning until night for three days. Now he said, I'm telling you, it's amazing. You've got to see God work. I would love to do it. I'm, I've already planning it. I'm already looking forward to it. Uh, folks, let me just tell you right now, we have been spoiled in American Christianity because those people don't have air conditioning. They don't have nice padded seats. Many of them have no vehicles to get to church. And you think it's hot out there? Try South Africa. So what's our excuse? We have been spoiled. So when something like a virus comes along and it it disrupts our amenities. We all up in arms. Well, I can't go inside a restaurant anymore. Well, I mean, I ain't thrilled about it either. I'm still mad at Chick-fil-A. <laughs> I ain't ate there in three weeks. They need to open up. I hope you're watching. Now, I understand it. Uh, their drive through takes about three hours to get through now. But um, no, but it's in all seriousness, we, we have been... We have been, uh, our, our comfort level has been upside down. And I'll be the first to admit, I ain't liked it either. But think about these other countries. They, their comfort level is nothing like ours. They're not, I mean, I don't know if they're complaining or not, but we sure are, right? God's been good to us, but you understand, most of the world, when they go to church, it's either fear of persecution I mean, fear of persecution where they may be caught. India right now is facing some of that. Where their, their president is threatening to, to punish. China, of course, is not even a... Uh, the underground church has been going on for years. Russia, the same thing. And some of these other countries, the same thing. Persecution on the rise. So a building like this, we may say, boy, I wish we had a bigger building. And, and I believe one day, if God sees fit, we're going to. But you understand... Uh, we ought to be thankful for what we got. Amen. I'll be thankful. So the prejudice is defined. Look, look with me in verse 1 again. The, James describes partiality as the respect of persons. That phrase, you see that phrase in verse 1? Respect of person. It actually comes from two words, which means to receive the face. Receive the face. The idea here is a person based on what you see. You receive the faith. It is to make judgments on uh, the external appearance of somebody. 
So we, that, that's what we do. We, we profile. You see someone, you're like, well, that ain't really what I thought that person would be. I remember one time I was preaching in Colorado uh, last, or two years ago. I flew into uh, Grand Junction. I love Colorado. It's beautiful. Uh, probably not a prettier state, to be honest. Grand Junction is gorgeous. And I was preaching up. I don't two or three days there. This uh, several churches had come together, and they had actually rented the downtown theater, a really nice thing. And they were having a two or three day conference, and, I, and me and another pastor was there, and we were just preaching and helping those pastors. And uh, man, some of them had come all the way from like Denver, and some of them had come all the way from uh, from um, uh, like Colorado Springs and different places, and and they converged right there. Beautiful little town. And uh, Colorado had just made marijuana legal. It hadn't been long. And so it was weird just walking out on the street. And I was, you know, they said, oh, preacher, your hotel's on the street. I'm walking down the street, and there's just a guy smoking. And I'm just looking at him like, dude, the cops are coming, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? I thought, well, and he's like, hey, man, what's up? You know, just, you know. And um, it was a different, different, uh, different place out there. Beautiful. Beautiful. But I remember the guy that picked me up at the airport with the pastors. He had never met me before, never seen me before, I don't think. And so I got off the plane, and he's sitting there, and he's looking. And uh, here I come. I think even more cowboy boots. I was going out west. I wore my cowboy boots out there. And uh, I did. And uh, he, I'm walking down the airport, had some jeans on and a plaid shirt and cowboy boots and a, a ball cap. And I'm walking through there, and I don't know who he's used to picking up. But I, he was looking. I walked right past him. So he just kept, you know, looking and stuff. And I'm looking for my ride. So I, you know, hey, man, uh, I'm here because they gave me the number to call. He's like, well, I'm standing at the, at the baggage claim. And I said, well, man, I am too. <laughs> so I turn around. He turns around. We're looking. He waves. I, I hey. And, and here's what he said. He said, oh, Pastor Cox, I'm sorry. And he said, I, I just, I pictured you different. I said, man, what do you mean by that? <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I just thought that, you know, that it's not. And I said, no, you just, you know, never seen a preacher in cowboy boots. But you're out in the West. And, uh, yeah, I just thought, you know, yeah, I think he had some, other, like, you're older than I thought or you're younger than I, I don't know what he meant by it. Or, um, but he, he definitely, I did not fit the mold in what he thought. And when he saw me, I think he profiled, maybe he thought, man, that sure ain't a pastor. Or, I don't know what he thought, I don't know. But, um but I, I kind of felt like maybe that's what went on. But you understand that's kind of what that means is the respect of persons. Matthew chapter 22 and verse 16. And they sent out unto him their disciples with the Herodians saying, Master, we know not that thou art true and teach us the way of God in truth. Now listen to this. Neither carest thou for any man for thou regardest not the person of men. It's unfortunate but often God's people can fall into that category. They just care not uh, for the people. For, for, uh, they regard us no man. Often folks are partial based on color or p based on class or based on creed. They're even a religion based on uh, cash. How much you got. How much money you got. Boy, I like you. You got a lot of money. But that, that's not how we should look at people. So partiality and prejudice has no place in God's house. None. Amen. Can we, can we agree on that? Let's go to the next verse. James chapter 2 and verse 2. Notice what it says. Actually, let's read a couple of verses. For if there come unto you your assembly, a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come in a, also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place. And say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? James kind of gives an illustration here, and I love it when they do this, because he kind of gives us an illustration of how prejudice works. Hey, hey, you, I want you to come sit over here. I've got a special place for you. Now, you, you can go sit over there, or you can get over here in the corner. You can go out back. Yeah, you're not really our type. I was reading in this book 
uh, titled Temptations Men Face by um, a, a Presbyterian uh, pastor, Tom Eastman. He said this, this took place in the Bel Air Presbyterian Church. Our president at the time, uh, he was a governor, Ronald Reagan, and Nancy Reagan, uh, he said this in a little excerpt of his book. He said, when in attendance, Governor Ronald Reagan and Nancy usually sat in the same seats they, when they attended this Presbyterian church, just off the center aisle, about two-thirds of the way into the sanctuary. On this particular morning, the governor and his wife were late, and by the time they got there, two college students had occupied their seats. An usher came down the aisle and asked the students if they would take different seats off the side. They moved. And Governor Reagan and Nancy were brought in and seated. To his credit, the pastor got up from his place in the, in the chancel, walked down over to the college students and said, as long as I'm pastor of this church, that will never happen to you again. Isn't that good? Now listen, I understand that if the governor of South Carolina came in, we'd, we'd like to find him a seat. But to be real honest, I'm not moving anybody to give the governor a seat. If we can, we can put these two nice chairs down here and set them down here. We could set something back there. You say, well, preacher, surely you would. Folks, listen. That man, although I respect him and I thank God for the job that he's doing, he is a man. I'm not going to take a kid that we picked up on a van and say, now you've got to move. The governor's here. We're just not going to do it. Not here. Now, if he went down to some of these other churches, they may do it, and that's fine. I'm not moving a member of our church or an attendee of our church just because someone's going to come and frequent. By the way, some of these people get up and they invite these politicians to their church, especially around election time. I've had a few of them call me wanting to know if they can come speak. and I'm polite about it, but I, folks, I'll be honest. I want to leave that out of here. Because the only time they're going to come to your church is election year. I don't care about that. I remember one of them came to my dad's church years ago. He just showed up and uh, sat in the very back. Boy, my dad preached a message. My goodness, alive. At the end of it, uh, the man was coming out the door, and uh, he was running for something. And of course, dad was very polite to him. And the man said, well, that was an interesting service I attended today. He said, yeah, if you come back next week, it'll be even more interesting. <laughs> and that's the truth. We shouldn't ever have to... Uh, get up and, and impress and all that. The one we should be impressing is the Lord Jesus. Amen. And He's the King of Kings. Now the Lord can come in and He can sit anywhere. Amen. Amen. We always want to make room for Him. Let's look with in verse number 5. We've got just a couple more minutes. The Bible says in James chapter 2 and verse 5, Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which He hath promised to them that love him. James asked a, a good question there. The word hearken is to call to listen attentively. He emphasizes the importance of instruction that is to follow. Now notice he says, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, the heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him. God has a special place. He has verse after verse after verse about the poor. When Christ came to this world, he was not rich Matter of fact, he, he had no place. The Bible says that the Son of Man had no place to lay his head. He, foxes have holes, birds have nests. The Son of Man had no place to lay his head. He was a homeless man. He, he, I could see our, our Lord sleeping under uh, certain places to get rest and finding places. and uh, other, He was living in other people's homes to get rest. So folks, you understand, our Lord, if He were to walk in, a lot of people would say, yeah, they, go get that homeless man some food. Oh, he wasn't well dressed at all and looked like royalty. He was a common man, a hard worker, a man that did not come uh, to the rich. He came to the poor. The Bible says, Blessed is he that considereth the poor. The Lord will deliver him in the time of trouble. Psalms 41 1. The congregation hath dwelt therein. Thou, O God, hast prepared of thy goodness for the poor. Psalm 68. 
Psalms 113 verse 7. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lifteth the needy out of the dunghill. Now here's what I, I, I believe about this. I believe we ought to go after all. Rich and poor. Middle class. It doesn't matter. Reach them for Christ. I'm not telling you that you've got to be poor in order for God to love you. But I'll tell you this. We ought to not neglect the poor. Matter of fact, here's what I believe. I believe if a church will go after all people, I'm talking about no matter what society class they fall into, no matter what race they are, if you'll go after people, the highways and hedges, and compel them to Christ, go after them, not them come to you, you go to them. Reach them. Like we did Saturday. There was about a dozen or 14 of us that went out Saturday morning, just our leaders, and we, we were able to lead three uh, precious souls to Christ. One of them was here Sunday morning. Hey, they, they don't have a whole lot, but guess what? God starts sending people that does. I've seen it happen. Oh, you may win some that don't have two nickels to rub together. I mean, they're poor. Poor in Job's turkey is what Dad always said. Poor. I don't know if Job did, had a turkey, but he was, must have been pretty poor. Job's turkey. Somebody thinks I'm funny. Some of y'all don't laugh at my stuff anymore, but I've got people that still laugh. Ma'am, I really like you. <laughs> Poor and Job's turkey. How many of you have ever heard that before? Job's turkey. Oh, you've heard it. That's why you ain't laughing. You're like, well, I say it all the time. And some of you haven't. But I'll tell you this. I've seen it happen to where, uh, where you go after people and win them to Christ. And I'm talking about people don't have nothing. And guess what? God sends, God sends people to your church that can fund. Hey, that can fund whatever it is that you need. Now, that ain't why we should go after them, but I'll tell you this, folks. Listen, we should never neglect a family or a person that does not have anything. They ought to be just as welcome as the man that drives in here on a, uh, you know, in some kind of nice luxury car. Why? Because Christ loves them. We ought to love them, too. The word hearken is to call or listen. We ought to go after people. I, I must hasten, but notice uh, what else it says here in... Um, uh, look at verse number 6 of James chapter 2. But ye have despised the poor. Now James is kind of scolding them here. You've despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats. So the word oppress. Do you all see that in verse 6? There's a, the word oppress. We hear it a lot. We hear it uh, a lot by the news media and certain organizations. And they'll say, I'm an oppressed person or this and that. But James actually uses that in verse 6. He says the word oppress here, it, it carries the idea of exercising power over someone. And, and we get that. The commentator says that the word has the underlying sense of being harassed or tormented. So you, you, there's another word I want you to focus on in verse 6, the word draw, D-R-A-W, draw. It has the idea of forcefully dragging someone against their will. So when we think about the word oppress and we think about the word draw, then we go down to verse 7, James says this, he asks another question, Do not they blaspheme that worthy, that worthy name by which ye are called? Well, what worthy name is James talking about? That's the name, the only worthy name, the name of Christ. That's it. He says, the people that you're catering to, the people that you're giving preferential treatment, are dragging you the wrong direction. Let me just say this before we close this evening, that if you find yourself catering to the those that maybe have a little something or those that have something to offer or the, a certain sect of society, do you understand that sometimes they can get a grip on you and take you any way they want to take you? For instance, you let a pastor get some folks in the church that has some money and all of a sudden that crowd gets bent out with something. Maybe you're starting to reach some people that are poor and so they, they come to the pastor and they say, Pastor, 
this person over here, I, I, we better be careful. They, they, this and that, and I don't like what you did here, and I don't like you letting so-and-so do this. And before you know it, you, you realize, man, these people, if they leave our church, they're, they're big givers, man. They, they give a lot, and they do this. And so you start finding yourself wrapped up in certain, you see what I'm saying? Before you know it, that crowd can control that, and all you are is a puppet. A puppet in the pulpit. That's why I think it's very wise that a pastor not know who gives what. I stay out of that mess. I don't want to know. I, I'm afraid that I would be discouraged by some and encouraged by others. Now, the encouragement is not bad. That, that it's good to know. But, buddy, the discouragement would be terrible. I couldn't handle it. Because you want people to grow and be obedient in the Lord and then to find out that they're not being obedient and then, and then finding out who's giving what. And then you, well, I'm going to go over there and listen to them and befriend them. But, oh, no, we can't do that. I, I don't want no partiality. You say, well, I, I bet they're getting... Well, <laughs> we've been disappointed before. I don't bank on anything now. I just trust God. A man driving a Bentley in here, a Rolls Royce, oh, I bet he's going to be a big giver. He may not give a dime. That little old widow might give everything. Hey, I've got a preacher friend, and we'll, we'll, we'll shut down on this, but I've got a preacher friend who was having a big offering. He was about to, uh, about like we are, about uh, paying some debt off. Boy, and now about, this is years ago. He's got a beautiful building now. He was having a big old offering, and the day that they were having the offering, we have ours typically in March. This past year it got... It got uh, all whacked out because of the virus. And so uh, that's coming back, though. Well, I ain't forgot about it. <laughs> but anyway, um, he, he was having, and a snowstorm came the Sunday. They were having this big offering. And man, they, uh, this was in a southern state, and he was discouraged. He said, Lord, you, I was here I was praying for, I don't know, it was like fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000. He said, I've been... Praying for that. It might have been even more than that. And he said, man, I ain't going to get a dime. I, I probably won't even get an offering today. And ain't nobody going to show up for church. Pretty good sized church. He was sitting in his, tr he was sitting in his truck and uh, with the heater on. He said, man, it was cold. He said, just him and a couple deacons. Deacons were in there trying to shovel off some ice in case anybody came. And he said, uh, he said I had one aggravating church member. And he was a Yankee. Doesn't mean anything by that. We shouldn't have any partiality here in this church. A lot of our church members are Yankees. I love them, unless they're from Michigan. That was for Mike Beach and the rest of the church. We got a lot of Michiganders. Luke Jobson, that was for, where's Luke at? Burnham, that's right. Where is Luke? He was here, I thought I heard him. Oh, there's Luke. He's usually in the back. So, uh, but anyway, he said this guy, he said, Pastor... No, hey, pastor. It's not, hey, pastor. Hey, pastor. He said, nah, is that bad that I'm talking like that? He said, uh, hey, I'm just, I'm just here. He said, man, I, I noticed that down, down here, down south, that the snow really, really cancels things out, don't it? He said, well, yeah, kind of. He said, pastor, do you mind if I get in the truck with you? He said, yeah, I do mind. That's exactly what he said. I do mind. He said, me and, I'm in here talking to God. Don't you see I'm in here talking to God? The guy's looking over there like, what well, is God over there? He said, I'm just, I'm just praying, talking to the Lord. He, he's, and then he, so about five minutes later, he came back, knocked on the door. Hey, pastor. He said, uh, uh, you mind if I talk with you? I've got something to give you. He said, man, I'm busy in here. I'm talking to the Lord. And I'm about to, you know, I'm going to go in there and preach. And he said, oh, okay. You know, about five minutes later, he came back. Boy, he was persistent. He said, Pastor, he said, I, I wanted to get in here and talk with you. He said, but you, you, you know, you're busy talking to the Lord. He said, but I got something to give you. And he said, well, what's that? And he gave him a big old wad of cash. He said, brother, I can just scoot on over. You get on inside this truck, God can get on out. And he said, Pastor, I just wanted to be a blessing. And I've been wanting to give this and been saving money and giving it to the church as an offering for this new project that God's put on your heart. He said, man, I felt God had humbled me because I'd, I'd been kind of pushing him off because, man, he'll, he'll tie you up and talk your head off. And he said, I was just, and he said, but it reminded me. He said, buddy, it was a, a, a he said it was bigger than any businessman. 
just, just, just said, here, put it in the church. He said, on a day that I thought that nothing was going to come in the offering plate, and I thought everything was off the table and that this, this was a wash, he said, God reminded me who was in charge. And he used a fella that I had no idea even had that kind of money. You know what? I think if we keep on doing what God, what pleases God, this thing ain't about money at all. God's been, listen, after four and some odd years of pastoring this church, God has reminded me time and time again that God is faithful and that He'll take care of His church. And He'll build it. He'll use people that you never thought He would use. And sometimes, sometimes, it's those that you think, that's it right there, that's the key, that's the missing link, that's the one we... It usually ends up being something else. Because God's ways are not our ways. We need to be reminded of that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight. If you have any needs tonight, many of you raised your hands tonight for personal request. And you've got some needs. Like I said, let's, let's lift up this little boy, uh, Hudson, in our prayers tonight. I promised his, uh, his grandpa that I would. I, I promised his dad and mom. Uh, that we would pray tonight corporately as a church, pray and talk to God on this little boy's behalf. And I'm sure there's lots of fear and uh, the unknown uh, going on in their hearts. Also be with those that I mentioned earlier in the um, uh, message tonight, those that are even here tonight that are battling. I see Brother Wayne Ames in the back. Got, of course, got a great report, and we're very thankful for that. Uh, we know God answers prayer. So that ought to encourage us to keep praying for those that are in desperate need of it. And um, we've got others that are having some family issues. And um, I see some out here that's had uh, parents that had strokes. And I, I think all of us just have needs. We just have needs tonight. It might be a financial need. Maybe you've got a job situation that's going on. Uh, maybe it's a marital uh, situation. Whatever it is, my God is not too small uh, to, to not be able to bring it to pass and help you and answer that request. He's not too big to not hear you and move on. He'll deliver it right on time. He's an on-time God. Let's pray together and ask the Lord to help us tonight before we receive our, our offering as we leave. Let me say, visitors, thank you for being here tonight. I really appreciate you taking time to come. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the text that we taught out of tonight. Thank you for the spirit of our people. I pray tonight that our church will never, never look at any individual and say, they're not good enough for us. I pray we'll never look at an individual and say they're too good for us. I pray we'll treat everyone the same. Lord, there may be one day where we're in a much larger facility, nicer stuff. But Lord, if you choose to keep us right where we are, we'll thank you just the same. You've been mighty good to us. You've brought us literally through a fire. You've provided things for us. You've uh, just showed yourself strong so many times. I pray that we'll keep the main thing the main thing. We ask all these things now in Jesus' name. All God's people said, Amen. Visitors, thank you for being here this